Hey yo, it's the Life Shot Podcast. Change your world and change the world. Hi, I'm Clint Grove. Uh, this is Life Shot, and today I have Ron Warwick with me. Ron made his international debate. Dubai. Debut. Ron made his international debut in 1963 World Walking Championships, the first of four appearances, and his last in 1974. And in between, with the help and guidance from many people, he managed to win two national junior and four senior titles, a Commonwealth Games medal, and become the first Briton to walk more than 16 miles or 26 kilometers in two hours when setting the UK national record in 1971. Ron, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you very much. <laughs> Glad to be here. Um, so today we, we want to hear about your experiences. Um, you know, Life Shot's about experiencing life and doing mm. what we love doing. Mm. And I, I mentioned earlier, just before we started, that it's it's about fine-tuning the body and mind in order to, ex- to mm. experience life in a, in a more vital way. So vitality mm. is really what we're aiming for, to, to be alive, the most alive that we can be, mm. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and you mentioned in an interview once that um, becoming the first Briton to walk more than 60 miles in two hours was a great highlight in your career. Um, but has that achievement been the highlight, has it been the highlight of your career? And, and if so, why, why is that? Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> the two-hour record was held by... Um, a guy called Ken Matthews, who was Olympic and European champion, and it was his record. Uh, and he, when I was first uh, getting into race walking, Ken, Ken was my idol. So to take take the record that uh, had been set by the guy I admired and found inspirational was was special. Um, but as for the highlights of my career. I, uh, I don't know because I, th- I think my life's in two parts. Race walk has been and athletics has been a large part of it. Um, but I think the most successful thing in my life is the fact that from being um, an obese uh, child at school and the pick of jokes and always the last person to be selected for the teams, uh, all that sort of thing. From that, I, be- I actually became an international champion. Uh, I served my time as a compositor in printing, that's hand-setting type, in the days before computers and things. Um, and I, it, that was a good grounding because apprenticeships are good discipline. But uh, as, as I grew older, I left that and went into, uh, into community and youth work. And the very ethos of all my work was what I'd managed to do. And as I come from, I'd say I was, my nickname at school was Billy Bunter. Uh, and it was, and kids can be fairly cruel. So from this, uh, this fatty, um, I, I managed to become an international champion. Mm. And and I, I used that through all my youth and community work career, which was the biggest part of my working life. So, in a way, it's the life journey as a whole that's been the great thing, uh, not uh, not not a particular athletic performance. And you you speak at schools and I, I, I have done in the past. Yes. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah. To help people maybe with the same or children with the same. Well, that not you really, because. I, as a youth worker, I, I never believed in in uh, promoting myself as a youth worker because I think once you once you get a, a tag for anything, then it can be counterproductive. And um, I had some run-ins with the youth service people because I wouldn't I wouldn't um, what should I say use their uh, promotional material mm. because I have a feeling that most youngsters. Uh, if they think you're on the, if you think if they think you are from the authorities or the governing bodies of things, they tend to <laughs> they tend to act in the reverse way that you want them to. <laughs> so, so then, from what race walking and athletics, as I said, on sports day, as a fat kid, I got sent to the discus and shot put circle, and that's where I was introduced to athletics. And I've been a, a, 
a support of athletics ever since because in track and field, no matter what your shape or your size, there is an event for you. Yeah. You know, if you're tall or lanky, there's high jumping. If you're big and powerful, there's the throws, the well, sprints, whatever. What is it that you actually hooked onto? Because you could do the discus and you could do it pretty well. Do they give you a bit of satisfaction or a bit of uh, Well, it does. I mean, if, if, if you go back to the, the uh, not-so-happy school days that I had, to suddenly be successful at something is great. And I think that's why I followed it with, uh, with, with uh, some endeavour. Uh, Bolton Harriers, um, who in the time had some pretty good athletes. Uh, Bolton Harriers was where I finished up uh, doing track and field. And they organised a trip to Manchester's White City in 1950. Six, it would be or fifty-seven. I can't remember, and it was a it was a, a North of England match against the against Czechoslovakia. Now the big athlete in that area was a guy called Emil Zatopek, who uh, was the first guy to win five ten thousand in marathon in the Olympics, which he did in nineteen fifty-two. And so we all went to see Zatopek, and uh, it was a. I mean, the White City was full. It was brilliant. And they had this chance, Zatopek, Zatopek. <laughs> uh, he, he duly won, but also in the Czech team was a guy called Josef Dolezal, who was a world five-mile walk record holder. And um, so they had this five-mile thing on, and uh, he started reeling off the laps. And like everybody else, I found it quite amusing, so I had a, I had a good old chuckle at this. What, the way they were yeah, running, the, the, uh, the, sorry, walking? Yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the funny gait that they had, or the comical gait that they have. And, and when you announced the, the, the time at two miles, it was 13-something, and I suddenly stopped chuckling and thought, this guy's walking faster than I can run. Anyway, I thought no more about it, and then a couple of years later, <clears throat> we was down the track doing my shot put and discus training, and there was um, uh, a lady doing some race walking, and the lady's coach was looking for somebody to sort of try and pace her for half a lap, and she was doing a mile, I think, and he wanted somebody that could sort of perhaps lay up with her or give her a, a lead for about half a lap at a time. So I said, oh, well, I'll have a go with that. So I did, and um, found I was reasonable at it. What age were you at this point? I'd be, I'd be 15, I think, 15. So that became a, a regular thing. In those days, you only train Tuesday, Thursday, raced or, or competed Saturday, and then Sunday was a... A sort of a mess about day. Although Sunday in those days was pretty... Church day. It was church day, yeah. yeah. It really was uh, a different day. And that's one of the things I miss about today, really. That hmm. There's no particular th day for there's it. No, there's no day. Whether you're a church goer or not, there's, hmm. every day is the flipping same. Uh, hmm. and, and that's sad, in a way, hmm. because you lose, you lose time. Just to rest, right? Just to rest and, and hmm. you know, be... be yeah. Unstressed. So anyway, so I th this became a regular thing, and I, st I started, and so for several weeks, leading up to this race that she was doing, I think it was the Northern Counties Women's Championship, I'm sure it was, um, I would do my shot put training, and then I'd assist her with her Is that shot, shot put, yeah? Yeah, shot yeah. put and discus, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, Sort of after, and because I did more of it with her, I got more proficient at it. And in the end, I managed to I, I, I walk with her for a, I tried to walk with her for a full mile. And I did, I think I did nine, nine, fifth, nine fifteen, and that was a three years third class standard. So I thought, oh, I'll have a go at this a bit more seriously. Well, so you thought I'm, I might be good at this? Yeah, got, yeah, yeah, things that you're good at, especially when mm. you've been. You know, as I say, you're the last person to be picked in every school team that was ever. You yeah, know, yeah. The, especially the the playground, yeah. the playground games. I mean, were, anyway, <laughs> so a year later, I won the uh, Lancashire. I did the double, the Lancashire discus uh, junior discus champion, and won my award winner. And then, uh, because I'd lengthened out a bit, I lost some of the weight that. Mm. Had been such a um, burden for me, 
earlier on. Uh, I started doing walking and I, well, things so, things you're good at, you do. So in those in those days, you you were a bit overweight. Was that down to maybe not being as active and but not so much the food being bad, or was it the food being bad and not being? Well, active? bear in mind, I'm I'm I was a war baby. Yeah. Um, and things. I mean, I still remember ration books. So things were pretty tough, and I think it was. I mean, looking back, our parents had a a tough time making ends meet. So I think our nutrition might not have been brilliant. Um, and I am from a big family. I mean, I, 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 when you were doing your walking at 15, 16, and you know, getting into it yeah. a bit more, same diet, but just more active? Uh, I think so, because yeah. we couldn't afford anything else. Yeah. I mean, it, it was, I think, uh, parents try the best to fill the, the children's bellies rather than think, you know, do we need more uh, yeah. more protein or, <laughs> or whatever. So that, it, it was a totally different time. Mm. So from there I, I sort of, and again, because I had the persecution at school, I think the fact that I was, I was um, good at something. Uh, and again, I, I got a lot of stick at first. You've got to be thick, uh, thick skin to be a race walker because people's, it is a comical gait, and people do take the mix. So you, you, when you went to go watch those guys up in Manchester, you were kind of giggling at the way that they walked. Yeah, yeah. So now you being in, you are now that person who might be giggled at, and so you yeah, saying yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's surprising once you once you start getting success, then um, people's attitudes change. Um, I mean, those days the, the the conductor used to stand on the on the there was a platform at the back of the bus and the the step off was it was open and on the training courses I used to do uh, on the bus routes bus conductors would sort of be on the platform and as the as the bus overtook me they'd say, come on Ron keep going you know and, and and that's another thing that's different from today in those days there weren't as many vehicles on the road but the drivers in in those days, they, they would often, as they came past, would wind the window down and say, "How far are you doing today? Go on, stick at it and, and encourage you." Whereas today, it's it's just zooming past, you know, the effing way sort of thing. <laughs> I mean, it's so totally different. Yeah. So that, that's the change in society, though, it's, uh, which which has come about. So for race walkers today, they they might be training on a track instead of on the Open roads, uh, well, yeah, bro, yeah. We, I mean, a lot of race walking events were were classic road events. Going back to the uh, the history of walking, which started by people challenging people. Quite often, it would be uh, Lord So and So would want to match his footman against the footman of uh, Earl so-and-so and, -so, and they'd, yeah. have a, they'd have a wager and the footman would have to do a, a tramp or whatever. Yeah. Um, and one of the most famous wagers took part in Newmarket uh, in uh, 1809 when a guy called uh, Allardyce Barclay, Captain Allardyce Barclay, took a wager that, to, that he would walk a thousand miles in a thousand hours for a thousand guineas. Wow. That means he had to walk a mile in every hour. He couldn't do five miles and have four hours off. Yeah. Had to be a mile in every hour. Now, a thousand hours is 42 days. <laughs> and he did it. And we actually reenacted it in uh, at the Bicentenary in uh, 1909. We reenacted it in town with uh, Richard Dunwoody, famous uh, jump jockey. He, he, he took the part of Captain Barclay. So so that was how, how, how race walking started. Um, and even in my day, believe it or not, we had the, there were a series of, of, of London sevens. Seven miles seemed, seemed to be a, an important distance. Mm. And these roads actually took part uh, along the, um, the Great North Circular Road. Well, you just can't imagine. <laughs> and and, be, and there were fields of 100 and 150. So you'd have 150 people strung out again along the North Circular Road during a seven-mile race on a Saturday. Um, 
they walk from London to Brighton, uh, Manchester to Blackpool, Hastings to Brighton. Mm. They had a walk round uh, Birmingham, the Birmingham out of Turtle Walk, the Bradford 50k that started in the middle of Bradford and 30 odd miles later finished uh, the other side of the city, having been up and all round Ilkley Moor. So, some fabulous races and, and today's uh, race walking in a way it's less colourful because because of the traffic on the ro- on the roads we've been driven off the roads so we're in parks or we're just doing kilometre loops uh, in a park or whatever so part of the challenge in my day was not only your fellow competitors but it, it was the course and there were certain courses. The Belgrave Seven was always considered long. Uh, the Met Seven was always considered fast because it was dead flat at Thames Ditton. Um, and you'd all this. You'd, so race walking in, in my day, I think, was far more colourful than it is today. And and people didn't bother about distances. So you know the Belgrave. To mention the Belgrave again, that was that was said to be over distance. Um, and there are other courses that might have been over distance. So if it was a seven miles, it was... was more than that. Seven miles or thereabouts, it could be a bit less, it could be a bit more. Whereas today, everything's got to be measured exactly, and, yeah. and standard. And, and, and in a way, that's taken... Because if you're having a... Because today, what's more important, apart from the major games, what's more important seems to be the times that people achieve rather than winning the race. And mm. really, at the end of the day, no matter what the statistics say about um, about uh, ranking lists, in the major games, you have to do it on the day. And you can, you can, you can win in a slow time. Uh, but the important thing is to win, if you can. So that, that mental um, ability... So, so I'm thinking about the, calling this programme uh, how, how to Be a Champion. Oh. And I think... <laughs> <laughs> no, and I know that you... you, you, you well, funny you should say that because yeah. at the moment uh, I've been an influence on two youngsters in this village. Yeah. Um, one is now at Leeds University called Callum Wilkinson. Uh, I'd like to think I helped him towards a World Junior Championship in, in 2016 along with a lot of other people. Along, I was part of his team. Mm. Uh, I've lost the track of what I'm saying now, Clint. Well, it's about uh, being a champion. Oh, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I've, I've lost the track. <laughs> so, um, but I want to know, the. how do you think that you influenced Callum? In, in, in which ways? Was it mental? Was it advice on his particular... Well, for one thing, I put a village walk on every year, a five-mile village walk. I, I, I don't... I call it a challenge. We walk to the next village, the windmill of the next village. And back and it's five miles and the challenge is to do it in under an hour or the challenge is just to do it yeah. depending on yeah. who you are and we've had people with heart transplants and all kinds of things do it and it's a great achievement for them to do it uh, at the other end of the scale we've got people like Callum who buzz around in about 34 minutes um, so it uh, how did I help him? Well, first of all, by giving him the opportunity to see race walking. Uh, I saw race walking because I'd gone to see the great Emil. Uh, Callum did it because there was this village walk every year. Um, and from that, I'm going back to, to I, I'm back on track now, <laughs> what you said about what becomes a champion. Yeah. And the greatest thing I did to help Callum become a champion was to put him in touch with a friend of mine called Mick Graham, who's a UK uh, grade four endurance coach. Because although I was a champion, and I knew I worked very, very hard, um, I couldn't teach what I did, mm-hmm. but Mick could. So in terms, so all I've done for Callum is be his friend. Put him in the right place. Put him in the right place. Yeah. Introduce him to the right people. So, and again, the sort of training that Callum's done, um, I think I did, but we didn't call it what they call it. Uh, now everything's sort of scientifically, biometrically analysed and all the rest of it. Um, whereas in, in my day, you, you listened to other walkers, what they were doing, especially the older guys. So is it- 
one of the things is it, it's important to have fun while you're doing it. And that's oh, kinda, yeah, 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 yeah. It's kind of what I'm getting from you in a way because mm. it's more colorful back in the day and it may be too scientific mm. now. Is there a message to be said that uh, you should have fun? You can use your science and your metrics, mm. but at the same time, make sure that you're enjoying what you're doing. Well, the, the, the big thing about race walking, and I think it's very similar in, in, in most events, is there is a camaraderie and... But walking in particular is one of the few events where your competitor or your rivals are interested in what you've done. And there's lots and lots of uh, sports where nobody's interested in what everybody else does, it's what they're doing. But certainly in race walking, I think it might be true of lots of endurance events, and we spend a lot of time sweating together on the road or the track or whatever, there's an interest in how you've gone on. Um, and even when, you know, in, in a major race, there's very, very, been very, very few pure, uh, poor losers. And I think that, that sums it up, really. There is a camaraderie there. That, I mean, Joyce, I only met Joyce through, uh, through race walking, but, you know, we're, we're friends, um, sharing interests in what each other are doing. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, I'm not sure the word's fun. I think, <laughs> I think I know, if, you've, uh, if you've been on the road for four, four and a half hours doing 50k in weather like this, which we used to do, mm. uh, then it's, um, it's not so much fun, but you've, I think everybody needs to test themselves, and that's one way of doing it, I think. So why would you, four and a half hours into a race, let's say, on a hot day like this, mm. you know, yesterday was even worse, but mm. today might be 26, sun's blaring down on you, um, it's 100 k's to the finish line, yeah. let's say, uh, or for another 50 k's. Mm. In that in that time, why why do you push yourself to get there? What reasons do you have to? Well, one finish? of the strangest feelings I've ever had, and I've talked to other athletes, and they've felt the same, is that you you train really hard, and again, no no sour grapes for today's athletes. Most of today's top athletes are virtually full time. In my day, most of us were doing a, at least a 40-hour week, fitting in the training and, 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 and everything else. I'm going off track again here. No, it's just about, yeah, it's about why, why do you do it? Oh, why do we yeah. do it? Yeah, so you do all this training. And strangely enough, on race days, when you get to the line, you quite often think, why? Why did I do it? Why am I here? Uh -huh. Why do I want to do this? And as soon as the gun goes, you're off because... You know, you knew deep down why you do it. It's because, hey, you're good at it. You get a bit of recognition for what you do. And you get great satisfaction from being master over your own body. So, I mean, that, that's always been the thing to me. But, uh, and again, another thing that's changed over the years. In the 50s and 60s, if people used to travel together, there'd be a club bus or if 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 the, if there was a national race walking championship in 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 the midlands or the north the southern race walking association would book a coach on one of the express trains from london so people used to travel together to race so there's a lot of banter mm -hmm. a lot of uh, interaction mm, on, uh, yeah Whereas today, people turn up in the cars, do the thing, get in the cars and go home. Yeah. So that's another big change that I'm not sure I'd, I'd be in it today. Well, yeah, but that's a challenge to people who do do it. Just oh, get yeah. a bus. You know, they don't have to oh, go. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's just that mixing together mm. uh, and travelling together that, that is no longer... Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it's a car folk now. Yeah. Uh, so that's another thing that's sadly, sadly passed. So the the race you did in was it Jamaica? Kingston, where, yeah, Jamaica, yeah, and it was yeah. really hot that time, and you decided not to have water, but everyone else was having water. What what was going on in your mind at that time? Uh, I think man, <laughs> I was feeling all well. Go wind wind the clock back about a, a month, hmm. and I'd. Um, 
I'd, I think I'd won the first of my national three years uh, two mile titles, and I'd won that in thirteen thirty something for two miles. Also, that was also the day that Ron Clark became the first person to run three miles in under thirteen minutes. Mm. Uh, now they run 5,000 metres under 13 minutes, which is half a lot further, but that's by the by. Mm. Um, I'd won the three years two miles in 13.30 something, which is something like 6.45 a mile. Walking six, yeah, that's yeah, pretty, pretty, pretty good. Yeah. So when I get to Kingston, although I'm walking 20 miles, we're walking is 8.20 a mile. Okay. So, so, the, I'm, <laughs> so I'm well, well within myself. Uh, and it's it's fairly, I know it's a lot further, but I've done the miles because to get that quick at two miles, you've got to put a, a huge amount of work in to get to that standard. So one of the reasons was that I did I did feel pretty. I wasn't confident I would win. I thought I could get a medal, but I wasn't sure I could win. And when I was sort of dictating uh, things after ten miles, but we went from the. Uh, Arthur Wint Stadium out to the airport along the coast road and back. Tremendous atmosphere, people lying in the streets as we came through Kingston people out on the road. It was really uplifting and made you feel good. Um, and I felt pretty good. I was uh, I was, I won't say I was bossing things but Were you, were I, you I, listening to your body at the time? Like hey my body feels alright. So. Yeah that's right yeah um and I thought, and when we come, and in those days, you could only feed at the recognised feeding stations. In Kingston, it was, it was five, ten, fifteen miles to the station. So coming up to fifteen, fifteen miles, and I felt all right, and I was I had a few, a few yards uh, in front, and um, I thought you're feeling pretty good here, and. I must have read somewhere about the psychology of it all, and I thought, if I pass up a drink here and just march on as though I'm completely untroubled, mm -hmm. which, to be honest, I, I felt I was, mm. uh, what kind of effect will it, have, will it have on them? Because I was frightened, although I felt I was in control, and I was still thinking in terms I could get a medal, I could get a medal. I thought, people like Ray Middleton, and you weren't at the front of the pack. You were yeah. maybe in the. In the no, front I was. Pack. I was. I was at the front of the leading the four lead or pack. five. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I thought, but Ray Middleton, who'd been our top twenty k man, Don Thompson, who was Olympic champion in nineteen sixty, so in all fairness, Don was a bit past his best. There was a guy in the race called Norman Reed, who'd won the nineteen fifty six uh, Olympics. But so again, Norman was past past his best. Uh, yeah. But just to be racing against these people was was a big thing for me because these were these were names I grew up with, Olympic champions, and, mm. and I thought once we get into that last five miles, they'll just turn on the turn on the gas and they'll be away. So I thought, well, so, so nothing to lose, try it, uh, and it happened. It, it came off. I opened up that what was it, half a minute lead and uh, never relinquished it. And whether it was a psychological, the thing is, if if I'd have finished up in a heap on the road as I did in Helsinki, <laughs> uh, some years later, then you know what, I'd have been I'd have been an idiot, wouldn't I? Yeah. So it, but it uh, paid off. It paid off then, yeah. And that's similar to what you were saying earlier, because you were racing against these greats, people who are really good, mm. um, but it's about winning on the day, isn't it? And and they could have yeah. beat you maybe in another race, but that particular race you well, won. Well, I hadn't beaten. Ray Middleton, who finished second, I hadn't beaten Ray over that distance. Norman Reed, the New Zealand, the Kiwi, when Olympic win fifty six, he'd he competed in the British in the English trial and he'd won. Uh, so the first three the first three home in the in the in the English trial was Reed, Middleton. Uh, did Don beat me or not? I can't remember. I might have been third in the trial. So you've raced with these guys before? I had raced with them before in the trial and they did see me off pretty easily. Mm. Now, whether whether they thought it would be the same result, a lot I don't know. The tips are in, 
there were three tipsters in Athletics Weekly, uh, and one of them said I was in with a chance of a bronze. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was nice to prove, prove them wrong, but you don't think of it in those terms. The first thing you think about is my mum and dad. <laughs> Making them proud. Yeah. yeah. Um, Joan was home, um, and all those people that support you and get you there mm. in those days they couldn't be there. that's different today because people so travel you were there by yourself yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so let's do that so it was it was great but again that that passes and you get on with other things in life i still kept race walking uh on and off for several years and yeah and i started me me uh using community work career in in new well, as my athletic career was, it could come to late 20s, I thought this ain't, you know, um, I need to be doing something different. My, my father had suffered a lot of depression. He worked for, uh, he worked for British, uh, well, London, Midlands, Scottish Railways, as it was then. He was a very modest, uh, quiet man. And all the changes with the beaching cuts and all the rest, really affected him. He was very worried about the future all the time. And I'd seen what doing the same job for a lifetime had done to my dad. So I thought, I must get out of this. And as a local boy makes good uh, in Bolton, um, somebody suggested I try to do some youth work, which which was easy. Because, uh, you know, Ron Wall gold medalist, da, 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 da. So, so I started that, did that part time, and then as I got towards my late twenties, thought I don't want to be doing this printing like forever. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> I could be doing the same thing every Monday morning for the next thirty years. As it happened, I wouldn't have done because uh, information technology in the digital world took over. But uh, so I started doing that part time. Um, Decided I wanted to do it full time, so I needed to qualify. Um, I know the only qualifications I had, because I'd only got a secondary school education, the only qualifications I had was uh, sitting gills for printing, uh, compositors' work. So I went to uh, went to night school, got the three O levels I needed to get into Leicester College of Ed. Did the youth and community diploma thing and then I only ever worked in Newmarket after that and enjoyed every minute of it. Dealing with people aged, well, from infants to retired stablemen in the 90s. Um, what was the activities in those in your work day? What would you do in that, in that type of work? <coughs> well, it could vary from... Uh, Finding the funding for some old dear who'd never had a washing machine to get a washing machine <laughs> uh, to, um, you know, refereeing around as much on a Tuesday night between two two stable yards. It, uh, we organised apprentice exchange schemes. Uh, we, um, that, that, was, that was hard work, but it was good fun. Well, not good fun, it was rewarding. And uh, we arranged or English apprentices to change places with the French apprentices. We organised international football, international cross-country with uh, France. We did an uh, international youth year project in 1981 where we had um, apprentices from uh, New Zealand and not a lot, but we, got, we, had, we had two or three from far-flung play, far places on the planet. So so let me get this straight, because it sounds like <clears throat> you said your dad was in a job where the future became threatened because of new technology. <clears throat> and um, printing, like printing, you're talking about doing in, a, in the printing business, how technology could also disrupt that uh, particular career, should we say. Yeah. And so... Am well, I right? We weren't aware of that at the time. You weren't aware of that, yeah. No, I mean, <clears throat> again... Uh, <clears throat> On, on leaving school, my preparation for leaving school was that the careers officer spent a morning in the school, interviewed everybody that was leaving at the end of that term, and really just tried to marry them up with a list of jobs he had. 
Yeah. And that was uh, that was it. <clears throat> so, but, so yeah. I'm just thinking, like, if we what the best advice that we could give, right, for people mm. listening, do you think it's it's because you sounded like you went into a, a type of work that you really enjoyed, and that was that youth work and that social. Oh, work. that yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you, it sounded like that you invested in yourself in order to be be able to do that, so that um, you were you were free to do that type of work. Um, and then not have to do a job for 30 years that you didn't particularly mm. like mm. and then worry about the future uh, if that... Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> the again, th that was only possible because I had a wife and family that backed me up. It's the same team that uh, assisted my, what success I had in, uh, in athletics because it meant uh, going to college for two years uh, we had two children by that, two daughters by that time. Still fully, fully uh, Linda was born 67, Sue was born 69, and I went to college in 73, so they were still quite young. But I couldn't have done that if John hadn't have taken in lodges to make ends meet. Uh, and she she did several jobs, again, because we, uh, we, needed, we needed the cash. Um, and again, it, it, it's funny how people look at it because people, when I when I used to visit uh, home in later years, people would say to me, oh, you were lucky you got out and did, did this, did that. I said, well, it, it wasn't really luck. We we suffered hardship for the time I was in college. We, you know, John took in lodges, uh, brought... Uh, and looked after the two two daughters. They came and joined me for me last year at college in Leicester. But uh, and it's the same thing. I used to get that in um, if I came back from Milan or somewhere. Oh, you, you are your lucky so and so again. I said, yeah, oh, of course it's luck. Yeah, all those all those um, all that training, all those miles I did. I, twice a week, I used to get up at half past four. Train five, five till half past six, and be in work for quarter past seven. Mm. And I did that in the winter of 62, 63, which was severe. It's the, it, football was off for 13 weeks. It was so bad. The ground was frozen. They ran to 12 foot, mm. down to dead 12 foot. And I began up to go out training. And my dad had been coming in from working the night shift. And uh, when he worked nights, he always lit, lit the fire so that when we got up in the morning, um, the house was warmed up. It was two up, two down town. It's typical mm. uh, of the Lancashire image of the dark satanic mills. <laughs> and it, it, it really was like that. So, uh, so on the days I was... Two days a week, I was doing this. Uh, I was doing this early morning thing to get. I need to get the miles in. Yeah. Um, You're very driven at this point. Yeah, yeah. I need to get the miles in. And again, you you've got to be steel will to get out your bed on a on a on 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 those sort of mornings and 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 go through it. And that's part of conditioning up here. Yeah. You feel that anything's possible. Uh, and on the days that I was doing that, I used to be up before my dad arrived, and so there was a fire when my dad came in, mm. and he'd be, be frozen, and, and he'd say to me, "Hey, lad, go back to bed; it'll do you more good." And that's and that's something that stayed in my mind all these years. <laughs> so, going back to me, uh, me, me career in youth and community work. In Newmarket, it was made possible because the lady down there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sacrificed. And, and, yeah, and she worked uh, because it, I was employed by Suffolk Youth Services, seconded to the Asla Trust. Um, and like lots of charities, we didn't have much money. Uh, so Joan worked as a volunteer for about two years till they could afford to take her on uh, full time. We did have new premises to start with, brand new premises, that was good. Um, and again, the, the job was great because 
we had we had youngsters from say fifteen who would come to town to on on what they call a trial to become a stable lad with the dream of eventually becoming a jockey, the odds of which quite slim. Very slim, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so we got these these youngsters, and at the other end of the scale, we had. Pardon me. We had uh, retired stable lads. One was a couple of them in the nineties. Still working at ninety. No, 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 no. They retired. Oh, so they retired. But they retired, they used to work but yeah, it. yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you've got this tremendous age range. Yeah. But also, because of the cosmopolitan nature of Newmarket, because they all came from different parts of the country, mm. Geordies, Taffies, mm. Jocks, uh, we had this two dimension. We had this dimension in age, where they could recall things that were happening in the twenties and so on. And also we had this this diversity from from of backgrounds, mm. so it really was fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. working yeah. in that. Yeah. And so as you were getting into, you, let's say, your fifties and sixties, did you continue to do that work? Has your career ever departed from that? Time? I only ever had one job as a as a community worker, and that was in Newmarket. Mm. It started in June nineteen seventy five, and I retired on my seventieth birthday in. 2011 yeah and for most of the time it, it, it was good and john worked with me all that time we we, we were a team yeah uh, and that's what's been good but i think a lot of you know making your own look i think a lot goes back yeah and although we're not church goers now we met through um i went to a methodist church not because of my parents mm-hmm. Uh, particularly religious, but it was something that was a boys' brigade there I could join, and they had a youth club. Um, I said, although we're not church goers now, I think some of the some of the standards we have were set by by that period where you know you you picked up what was right, what was wrong, what was honourable, what was you know, um, I suppose in a way you develop a bit of a conscience which later on in life stands you, should stand you in good stead. I mean, mm. when we left college, um, when I left college, we, most of my colleagues were looking for... Um, the main thing was the salary, salary, and the incremental scale that went with it. Um, that never particularly bothered me. It's like cars; cars have never, big cars or flash cars, or they've never bothered me. It simply gets you from A to B. Yeah. Um, and they were looking for, and that their criteria was salaries, incremental scales. I was looking for, um, I'm not sure what I was looking for, but I applied for two jobs. One was a, a, a so-called youth club in Bedfordshire, a village called Harold, which in the end they really wanted a caretaker, so that, that, that <laughs> was with me. And this one, which was uh, a job with uh, Suffolk Education Services. Um, and compared to some of the other jobs that were going, the the, de- the offer here uh, financially wasn't all that great. But within five years, most of my colleagues were disenchanted with the uh, with the uh, sec- with the uh, <coughs> with the work career. Work or the that's right, yeah. Because most of what most of the projects, if they came up with a project. They were encouraged to do it, but it had to be self-funded. Mm. Now, because I was with a charity, if I made a case out to the trustees for a project like the uh, Apprentice Exchange Scheme, um, or we, we organised an art exhibition for stable staff that went round the various race courses showing off that the, these people who looked after the horses 
mm. had other skills and, and interests as well, such as that, if I made a case for it, then the trustees would find the money for it. Okay. So in the end, in the end, I, I, <laughs> I didn't go for the big money, but I got the best deal. Yeah. Um, so and, 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 and they looked at, they looked after us. Very good. So, Ron, um, you're our oldest guest to date. Oh, um, really? Not that we, we look at age too much, but mm. the reason I mention it is because um, we want to get some some like nuggets from you, some bit of wisdom for the age group that listens to to me of between 30, 40, and sometimes 50. Mm. Um, what would you say is the most important per- lesson or that, that someone could learn about life now in their 30s and 40s where they trying to rediscover themselves and maybe they want to change career paths or what is it that we need to learn in our 30s and 40s that would hold us in good stead you know as we get older into into mm. retirement and your age that you'd be happy at your age you know and, and not regret things in the past is there something that you could um, give us that's, that's, that's <laughs> difficult um don't judge people uh, one of the things about youth work is that, uh, and community work is that you, you don't, you don't judge people. You take people as they are. Um, that doesn't mean to say you have to approve of what people do, but uh, it's their life and they've got to get on with it. Um, and always look to what other people are doing. That's the other thing. Um, if you just enveloped in yourself, then life's going to be pretty narrow and pretty stunted. Um, and it's people that make life interesting. You can have the finest leisure centre in the world with the best facilities, but if there's nobody in it, <laughs> yeah, it's bricks and mortar. Um, and I think... I don't really know what to say. It's just that well, French, friendships are important. Mm. Um, see, people once somebody once said to me, um, "You've done a good job bringing your girls up." Mm. And I said, "Well, what do you mean?" He said, "Well, you know." I said, "Yes, yeah, so, but we there's no secret to it. We." We have standards and beliefs, and uh, they've just picked them up from us, and that's that's why they're like they are. It's not that there's been any special uh, plan to make sure they're brought up properly, but they've been brought up mm. as I mean, from being they were a lot of people say they've been messed about a lot. Within six weeks of being born, they were. They were trundled in a little minivan to uh, events all over the north of England, <laughs> uh, which meant that uh, um, they became part of our life instead of them becoming our whole life. And I think that's that was good for them because there so many aunts and uncles, it was unbelievable. Um, and that's the thing about athletics, it's, it's, it's good for families. Um, so I don't really know what the answer is, if I'm, in fact, if I'm honest. Well, I mean, I think you said it because your your life as an example to your kids was that you invested in other people. You you looked, you were invested in look, helping mm. people. Mm. Um, so not just inward looking, but in, no and, matter where you are, yeah. what job you're doing, you, you're yeah. trying to help others, right? Another thing my dad said was, I'd rather do a good turn than a bad one. Mm. And again, that's, Something else that's yeah yeah so. and, and the and the judging thing is is very I think it's it's key as well I I tend to be more judgmental in the past and I'm trying to not be judgmental mm. now mm. Um, mm. because that just isolates you into a certain box yeah. like this is my box and everything yeah. outside my yeah. box is not right yeah. Yeah. you can make a lot of work for yourself uh, by being uh, understandable and approachable. Mm. But um, you've got to be yourself. An instance when I was working was uh, a young lad, a young man came to see me. And part of me, uh, my modus operandi was 
I spent a lot of time down at the we had, down at the club premises, and you spent a lot of time there. Because I think if you spend time with people, that's when you get to know them. That's when you get onto a real, mm. a real um, close, not close, but understandable uh, relationship. And there's one day, this this it must have been his early twenties, and he said, uh, "Oh, have you got a minute?" I said, "Yeah, of course I have." He said, "I." I've been meaning to talk to you for a couple of days, he said, but I could tell you were up to your neck in it, so I didn't bother. <laughs> and that, to me, was a uh, vindication that this this person knew me well enough and could and could decide that whatever it was bothering him could wait because he could see I got something more important on. Okay. And I think it's that kind of relationship with people where you know, they, they understand you as well as you understanding them is important. And that's good for that building of relationship, that strengthening yeah, of relationship. Yeah, yeah. That, that you, yeah. like you said earlier, friendships are important yeah, as you get yeah, older. Yeah. And so, it, I mean, you may not see people very, very often. Uh, one of our things this year is that we, we're trying to see people we haven't seen for a long time. Yeah. Um, and that's which we're managing so far. But it, it is important. So you've got to take the effort, right? Effort, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. some people don't. They maybe is it is is it true? Do you think that some people don't want to reach out for fear of rejection? So, oh, let's reach out to let's have a get together at my house and invite a whole lot of people. You know, is it the fear of people not pitching up? Do you think, or is it more just I couldn't be bothered? I think some of it's just down to your nature. Yeah, I mean the very fact I was. Persecuted it uh, as a, in a way, when I was at school. Mm-hmm. Not only by the kids, I'd one, I'd one gym teacher at the secondary school I went to, a Welsh guy, and he was horrid to me. Whenever he was demonstrating new exercises in the gym class, he always had me out demonstrating, which was amusing for the class. So I think once, if Maybe that just uh, give me an edge that, well, so what? Nothing can happen now. Mm-hmm. I mean, I look back now and I think all those people I envied at school who were good at football and cricket. Um, I wonder if uh, I wonder if I had to go into their sporting careers mm. because I've got an England blazer and a Britain, a Great Britain blazer in my wardrobe. I wonder if they ever got I wonder if you're anywhere near that. Mm. And what's more, I can still get in these jackets. Well, I could have watched a couple of months ago. Uh, how many of these people, you know, I've had the privilege of meeting the Queen more than once. Mm. Uh, you know, I mean, so, and mixed with some pretty high powered people, um, which was hard. Uh, and I always felt a certain amount of unease, but I was able to do it. And I think having that um, rather rigorous grounding at school probably probably Sh- shaped, you a little shaped bit. me a little bit, and and, and made made most well maybe to take most things in my stride. But it was the athletics and the travelling with the athletics that that um, was the big step forward because I saw lots of other things. Was part of a team. Um, Privileged to meet some of the great, some great Olympic champions and whatever. And again, so Mm -hmm. my mixing with them it had a rub off on me. Yeah, yeah. So it's who you hang out with as well. Yeah, who you hang out with as well. Ron, well, it's been great hanging out with you. Oh, thank Uh, you very much. (laughs) Telling us um, how to become a champion and. It's really been... Well, I don't know whether I have or not, but it's... Uh, no, I've enjoyed the stories. I've enjoyed the stories. So uh, thanks a lot for, for coming on Live Shots. and uh, My pleasure. Well, we wish you all the best for the future. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ronald.